Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Today's sponsor is Gemist. I don't know about you, but every so often I really need to mix up my shampoo and conditioner because I get sick of whatever I'm using. So I took this quiz online on Gemist's website, and they recommended products for me and then sent me the shampoo and conditioner, and now I am obsessed. So it's it's just amazing, and now I'm really excited that they're my sponsor, not to mention that Gemist is a women-owned company. The CEO and founder is Allison Har. She's a mom of two, a dog mom, and a Harvard grad. It's a subscription service, so I like don't even have to think about when I'm running out as opposed to you know, trying to squeeze out those last little drops from the containers and having nothing left. And their quality ingredients, which are sulfate-free, paraben-free, dye-free, never tested on animals, and manufactured in the U.S., so that's all awesome. And it's shipped right to me and, well, will be to you as well. Uh, And it looks and smells amazing. So definitely try it out. Uh, If you're ready to have the best hair of your life, try Gemist. And right now, my listeners can give Gemist a try and get 20% off their shampoo and conditioner subscription. So go to gemist.com, get your personal recommendation, who doesn't love a quiz, and enter Zibby, Z-I-B-B-Y, at checkout for 20% off and free two-day shipping. That's gemist.com, G-E-M-M-I-S-T.com, and enter code Zibby at checkout to get the best hair of your life. Elizabeth Mickey Brina is the recipient of a Rona Jaffe Breadloaf Scholarship and a New York State Summer Writers Institute Scholarship. She currently lives and teaches in New Orleans and is the author of Speak Okinawa, a memoir. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you so much for having me. Your book, Speak Okinawa, is beautiful from the first sentence you are immediately immersed into your story, your relationship with your mom, the complications, the history. I learned so much more than I ever knew about Okinawa. So thank you for that. That was also great. But the way you wove it in was so effortless. It was like, it's like you were teaching, but sharing, I don't know. It's, it's been great. So anyway, bravo to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. For listeners who don't know what it's about, can you share a little bit about this memoir and and what inspired you to write a memoir to begin with? Okay. Well, the book is essentially about, as you're saying, repairing my relationship to my mother. For most of my life, I was felt very estranged from her and I rejected her. And that had everything to do with me not knowing who she was or where she came from or the history of the place where she grew up and also like not wanting to know because, you know, my mother grew up in Okinawa, but I grew up in a very white, very homogenous suburb of upstate New York. And I was like very, you know, it was during the 1980s and 90s. So like not the most accepting woke decades (laughs) of our era. (laughs) And I was ashamed of her for much of my life. So the book kind of it tries to describe and and explain this repairing process, my discovery of who she is and like who I am. Well, learning about how she met and married my father, who was a soldier stationed on the island, which was a U.S. territory, occupied U.S. territory at the time. And yeah, and so like these like imperialistic origins, right, embedded in the dynamics of my family and like influenced the way I related to her. And the way I thought of myself. And your dad was like living on the Upper East Side. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's like completely different, yeah. right? They have like, like, they could not have had your mother's family. There were nine of them living in a room together, yeah. right? Six <laughs> siblings and two parents in one room and like extreme poverty yep. and just, you know, the way you depicted it. And then, you know, your dad, at like waltzing into Loyola and like, you know, it's like you could not have paired two vastly different backgrounds. I know. And then when you talk about it in the book, it's like, yeah, 
sometimes people meet and fall in love from totally different backgrounds, but do they mesh? You know, you raise mm-hmm. this really interesting question of like, okay, then what happens? Mm-hmm. And then what happens in the next generation? And like, is it always so simple as just two people getting together? But what about all the the cultural and the history and all of that? Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it was always like for, for a long time, it was always presented to me as this like very romantic love story, <laughs> kind of like a movie, but also like kind of like sim- simplified, right? And uh, romanticized. But yeah, that's figuring out where all this like, these thoughts and feelings come from, it comes from the, these clashes, you know, like growing up all like the anxiety and like those self-loathing and things like that. It comes from the not being aware of the clash, right. And how, yeah, it's not always so simple, right. It's not always easy. And, you know, you write about it in such a factual way, like, and then the kids at school started calling me this and then that. And, <laughs> There was a lot of sort of racism directed your way. I mean, that was a lot Mm -hmm. to take. And tell me about the sort of lingering effects of that. And I know you said, you know, perhaps had you been a child right now, things would be quite different. So there was, (laughs) I really hope hope so. so. I hope so. Yes. (laughs) I hope so too. Mm -hmm. But just that feeling of being other, being different, Mm -hmm. you know, the 1% in your book references the 1% of non white people really in your community growing up. So, Tell me about the lingering effects of that, you know, hatred, not hatred, but just like all those remarks and barbs and all of it. Just tell me about that. Yeah. Gosh, the lingering effects. If there, if there are any, I shouldn't, I shouldn't suppose, I shouldn't assume that there are any. I I think, uh, no, there, there definitely are. (laughs) I wrote, I wrote, (laughs) I wrote a whole book about that. (laughs) Okay. 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 Well, you know, I just. No, you're, you're absolutely, yeah, you're right on point, but it's also because the lingering effects are just so intertwined with everything and it's hard to like pinpoint, but I mean, I, like you said, I always felt, I always felt very other, very outcasted. And I think, I think actually, you know, at first, like in my twenties and early thirties, like this, this outcastedness, like really hurt me. You know, I've just, I never felt like teens, twenties, I never felt like I belonged. Like I always felt like just I could never find just my my niche. But now I think, and the writing this book has everything to do with that, is I'm, kind of, I'm okay with that. You know, I'm okay with like not fitting in, right? And just kind of bouncing around from different groups, different places. And, 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 that, and I think that that helped a lot. I think in a lot of ways, like I helped me develop some empathy, right? Because everyone in some ways feels that way, not belonging. So I, I kind of have this soft spot for, <laughs> for people who are lost and confused. <laughs> so in a lot of ways, it helped me work to my advantage. In the way that you depicted life in Okinawa for your mother and her family, you talk about some of the inherited trauma that had gone on mm-hmm. and the difficulty of that. And I just wanted to read this one quote. You said, you were talking about stories you wish you could have heard. And then you said, yet these memories are impossible to forget, regardless of whether we actually lived through them. I believe they stay in our bodies as sickness, as addiction, as poor posture or a tendency toward apology, as a deepened capacity for sadness or anger, as determination to survive, a relentless tempered optimism. I believe they are inherited, passed on to us like brown eyes or the shape of a nose. That was beautiful, by the way. And there's so much talk about inherited trauma. How much do we, is it in our DNA somehow when things have happened before us? So what do you, what do you make of this? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure there's science behind it, which I'm not, I don't know anything about the the actual like physical, biological, like what happens to your genes. Right. But I've heard these things, but just like, through experience, right? Like the, you know, like the pain, the pain stays inside you and it has to go somewhere. Like it doesn't just go away. And especially like, you know, my mom grew up, she grew up after World War II, right? But, and I think what a lot of people don't know is just how completely devastating the Battle of Okinawa was. Like the whole island was destroyed. Like so many people died. And then, but my mother grew up three years after the battle ended, but it was still so present, right? Like how could, how could she not absorb all of that grief and pain? And then 
you know, when she was growing up, that's when all the military bases came in, the American military bases. And, and that, ha- you know, that children just absorb that, <laughs> even if they're not cognitively thinking about it. And I think the same way with even, you know, another generation removed from all that trauma because of what my mother went through and what she witnessed. And, oh, this is the case for a lot of people, but she like was really had a problem with alcohol. Right. And so, and that was a a cause of a lot of strife growing up. And then when I grew up seeing her pain, right, like I take that (laughs) and then I create my own and so on and so on. So it's, yeah. And I think the only, you know, I mean, I think there's ways to, obviously, I think that my life and my pain is like not as awful as my mother's and not as, and hers probably not as awful as like someone who had actually experienced the battle, but so, so it gets better, but it's still like, it has to, it has to go somewhere, right? Like we have to work through it until, until it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Mm-hmm. So when did you start writing? I think I started actually writing when I was 12, probably when I was 12. And I had just finished reading The Outsiders mm-hmm. in eighth grade. And uh, like, that was it. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm going to write this. Like, so I got, I got kind of hooked. Mm-hmm. And then did you continue to write through, tell me about your whole writing. Yeah. I, up till, I, up till now. it was, it was, <laughs> I, I've always tried to try to write. Like I, I think for a very early age, I was like, I want to be a writer. That's what I want to be when I grow up. And so I started writing short stories, poems, screenplays, I never, like, I didn't know there was, for a long time, I didn't know there was such a thing as memoir. Like, I didn't know that this, that this existed. All the stories that I wrote were about me. Like, <laughs> and uh, when I called them short stories, I called them fiction, but they were clearly just, that was, that was it. That was my life. And I definitely hid from myself a lot in the early writing. Like, I never wanted to talk about my heritage. I never wanted to talk about my mother. Like, those things weren't interesting. I was always trying to be like very universal, like so white, you know, like, (laughs) and then I sometime after college or like maybe it was like the last years I had this block, like I had this incredible writer's block. I could not write anything, like nothing would come out. And it was like devastating. It really took a toll on me. I was like, why can't like every, I scrutinized every sentence. I was like, no, that's terrible. That's bad. I can't put this out into the world. And then, so I stopped for like 10 years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wrote like maybe very randomly, you know, and then finally I just, I was, had been teaching for, I was a special education teacher in Oakland for five years. And while I was doing that, I was like, I can do this. This could be who I am. It wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) I am like very bad at classroom management. So then the school closed down and it kind of gave me this, like, well, what am I going to do now? What have I like, just kind of like the the epiphany moment. Like, what have you, what have you always wanted? And so I was like writing, writing, let's, let's get back. Let's try to get back to that. So I applied to graduate schools, MFA programs. And it was there that like, once I started getting like very formal feedback, People were telling me like what they found most moving, most interesting. And it was always like my mother, my, you know, my, like these, my complicated parents. And I was like, what? No, like, we don't want to talk about that. That's, uh, you know, and then, but eventually I just, I dived in. (laughs) So. And what was it like reliving all of this and writing this book? How long did it take? When did you decide it was going to actually be a, a like a freestanding memoir in this form? Oh gosh. Yeah, it started I started writing it 6 years ago. And it was like, you know, this is a book that I needed to write my whole life, right? Like this is it's been building up inside of me for a long time. Eventually it had to come out. And the most immediate catalyst was my mother's baptism. Mm-hmm. And so I my my mother had recently joined the Rochester Japanese Christian congregation. And I had no idea what this church was. I just thought like, okay, yeah, they're, they're probably Japanese and they're Christian. <laughs> and they're, I, I also like, was very like kind of condescending about it. Like, oh, it's more colonial stuff. Like, you know, converting these Japanese people to Christianity. And then I went to her baptism and I realized that all the members of the church, there are about 50 of them in the greater Rochester area. 
they were almost all women and all the women were around my mother's age and they were all married to white American men who had served in the military. And that was just like, whoa, (laughs) you know, like, what is this? And that was the first time I realized that this is not, there are more people like my mother. Like I always thought that her marriage to my father was a strange coincidence, right? Like this romantic story, like... (laughs) Like they meet at a bar and they, you know, love at first sight. But then I seeing all these women together, I was like, no, this is part of something bigger. So this is, this is a larger social phenomenon. And it started as an essay I was going to write just about the baptism. And Mm -hmm. I was reading a lot of Joan Didion at the time. So I was like, this is going to be like this literary journalism and I'm going to do all this research. But the, you know, the research kind of like, then I was like, it was me. It's like, I can't believe I grew up not knowing any of this. I can't believe I grew up not knowing my history. And it got bigger and bigger and and more and more personal because it was like, I was angry about it. I was like, like, just kind of how much this could have helped me understand myself and understand my mother. So it was painful. Like you said, I had to relive a lot of moments that made me upset with myself, (laughs) But I think that the writing helped heal, right? When, when you write it down, you, you can hold it still and you can examine it and you can give it clarity and, and purpose and maybe even make it beautiful and like it was all worth it somehow. <laughs> and so, so that part has been actually very healing for me. And also like I, this was how I got close to my mother, Because when I, you know, when I'm writing it, I had to ask her all these questions about her life. I had to find out things I never knew about her before and get, you know, find the real story, right? Like not the, not the romanticized version. And it became just just so much easier to talk to her after that. Our conversations used to feel very like strained and forced, but now it's carried over. It's like, now that we know each other, right? It's just like, oh, your mom, like, hello, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so that that's been yeah that that's probably been the most beneficial part right (laughs) of the of the book amazing yeah I know you had said that one of the obstacles to getting to know your mom is that you spoke different native languages and while you spoke some Japanese as a child pretty soon how you thought and spoke and how she thought and spoke just didn't you know connect and I know that that happens to so many families when people immigrate and the you have different first languages even and the no. barrier, the unnecessary sort of barrier that puts up immediately between two people within a family. Yeah. Which is tough. And I think it's also, I mean, that, you know, like I said in my book is, is everything, right? Like my mother and I don't speak the same language, yep. but also that this power dynamic because my father and I do speak the same language. And so that was hard because it was always just this like, you know, us against her, but it set up that dynamic you know, maybe not, not intentionally, but you know, how, how could it not? And that was another thing too. It's just like, why didn't I learn Japanese growing up? Like, why wasn't that a priority? You know, that's what you, and, and I don't think that either of them thought, I think, I think my father is more responsible for that than my mother, but I don't think either of them thought that, that how important that would be and how, how much that would strain my relationship. Oh, but the, but the upside. (laughs) Yeah. Tell me the upside. Well, I mean, I, I think that it, you know, we have, oh, like so many more ways to communicate, right. Than, than words and languages. And I, I think that's one of the things that my mother and I have been able to do is just find our own like rapport that does it like a very shorthand of phrases that mean so much more. Right. And that, and that's been kind of beautiful. It's just to kind of create our own language together. Has she read this book? She hasn't. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Tell me about selling this to Knopf and becoming like a debut memoirist there, which is like such a highly respected literary imprint, or I should say not imprint, but firm. (laughs) Tell me what that, what was that like? Tell me about selling the book. Oh my gosh. That was a total dream come true. Very, very unexpected. And I'm so, I'm still so grateful. Like I, I have to just remind myself sometimes like this is happening, you know, like uh, when I, when I get very stressed and bogged down, it's like, no, like that, you know, like that is enough. 
that, that right there. Well, I really, I didn't, when I was writing this, and I think that's very important. When I was writing this, I didn't think about where it would end up. And I was just thinking like, this is a story I have to tell. I have to give it my all. And I was really just thinking whoever would take it, like who will take this? <laughs> and I, I went to Breadloaf. It's a, like a, a writer's conference in Vermont. And I, you know, submitted the, the first chapter to be workshop because I had, I had written that first chapter so many times that I couldn't even see it anymore. And I also, and I, and I didn't even, I was like, is this any good? <laughs> because I had submitted it to so many places and it got like, you know, just rejected so many times. Like, is this okay? Am I, do I know what I'm doing? And the fellow at the in the workshop named Francisco Cantu was like the, this book's guardian angel. Like he's amazing. He read it and loved it, which is like so validating. Just like, oh, thank God. Like someone, you know, someone recognizes this. And then he, he introduced me to my agent my agent's incredible, like just like the the book deal of my dreams, right? <laughs> so it happened really, it, it, it took a really long time and then it happened very fast, which I think is, seems to be common, <laughs> common experience. So exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are you doing now that this is coming out? Are you continuing to work? Like, do you have a day job? Or are you writing full-time or? I'm writing part-time. I'm working just on some, on some essays here and there. I, <laughs> I can't help, but like I, I write to understand myself, right? So I, I continuously am like and jotting, and jotting down things, and also this craziness, right? Like <laughs> I, I need some sort of processing through it all. This crazy time that we're living in, but I get my routine, my schedule is I have a part-time tutor at a community college, so that keeps me grounded. <laughs> <laughs> And I love it. I feel like I feel like that's the best thing like that applies to so many people. I write to understand myself. Mm -hmm. It's so simple and yet it's so true. I mean, that is why I think so many people write. I know like anytime I have an issue, right, with anything, or I'm like, I'm like, if I could just sit down and put my fingers on the keys yeah. and give myself an hour, I will sort through it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's just there's something about writing that it, you know, I, at least I find, and obviously you, like it's better than, it's for me, it's so much better than talking. Right. Like <laughs> I can try to talk about my feelings, but if I write about it, like, you know, yeah. it, it all like, you know, and I don't know, and it's magic. And there's something about like, like finding the right words, right? Like, no, wait, is that what I'm feeling? No, let me, let me think about it. Right. Right. And, yeah. so, and so then you can really understand it. Right. Like, it's like, this is exactly what I mean. Where, whereas talking, it's just <laughs> yes. whatever comes Not to mind right. at first. Exactly. You can't like copy and, yeah. paste <laughs> you, can't, and right. you know, find the exact right <laughs> metaphor. Right. And, you know. <laughs> yes, that's true too. So what is coming next for you? I'm trying not to look too far ahead, you know, because of the world, because of, yeah. because of everything. So just kind of like one day at a time. But like I said, I've been I've been writing a lot of essays or like parts of essays. They're all sort of peripherally about my parents because they'll endlessly fascinate me, and they're also the most important people in my life. So they're like in my yeah. life. <laughs> good material. Yeah. Good, good source yeah. of material. Keep tapping that as long as you can. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but also exploring and trying to resolve my own relationship issues. I know that was kind of like a, a, a very loose thread in the, the book mm -hmm. that I just finished. So we'll, we'll see where that takes me, right? <laughs> I'm just launching now an online publication for Medium. It's called Moms Don't Have Time to Write. <laughs> so if you want to write an essay, if you want to find a home, I'm sure you could anywhere, yes. but you know, Thank we're you. publishing Thank lots you. of essays. So. Yeah. Anyway, I will check it out. <laughs> what advice would you have for aspiring authors? Oh, um, well, I still sort of consider myself a, an aspiring author that it hasn't fully sunk in yet. But I could say what what worked for me and I think that is finding a story that that you have to tell, right? That is just like it's inside you and it, and you can feel it growing and like, you know, uh, and and it has to come out. And finding the story that only you can tell. Like, I think that we all have our own unique perspectives and contributions. And I, I think what I did, what a lot, a lot of new writers do is maybe tend to focus on the stories they think that they should tell, right? Like what other people think is interesting and important. 
And that doesn't sustain you, right? Like that, that won't, that won't keep you like sitting in a chair writing. So I always try to think about like, what am I constantly worrying about? What am I constantly wondering about, obsessed about? What am I trying to figure out? Right. And, and that's what drives me uh, to get me to finish. And I also try to write to myself as a reader. Like I think of when I reread my own work, I think to myself, like, what do I want to know about? Like what, you know, what comes Mm -hmm. next? What do I want to know next? (laughs) Right. What dark secret do I want myself to reveal? And also just what I want to sound like. I reread my sentences over and over again and try to think like, what would I be proud to say? Mm -hmm. And then that way I learn to sound more like me. Well, you are truly a beautiful writer and so I Thank you. love your writing style. I just love it. It's not like overly flourishy and yet it's still literary and it teaches and inspires. And I don't know, it's just like very captivating and it makes you not want to stop so reading much. what you're writing, which I don't <laughs> say often. I have to say, I mean, I mean it though. I just love what you write and I want to read like anything else that you oh, write gosh. going forward. Thank you. And, um, <laughs> I can't wait to see what you do. I mean, this is just your debut. So it's always really exciting to come across like someone super talented who's just getting started. That makes me so excited. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Anyway, <laughs> no problem. All right. Well, congratulations Thank on you. Speak Okinawa and I'll be following along your journey and I'm excited for Yay. you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Today's sponsor was Gemist, G-E-M-M-I-S-T dot com. Give it a try, 20% off their shampoo and conditioner subscriptions. Go to gemist.com and get your personalized recommendation. Enter Zibby at checkout for 20% off. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 